Hi, uh, this is one in a series of seminars that I am presenting uh, through the, the help of your local cable station. Uh, I'm trying to do these all these seminars as one half hour seminars. They replace seminars that I would typically do at the library or at the senior center. They are on a variety of topics that I think would be of interest to you as seniors. And today's is one that's really extremely of interest, um, which is getting care at home during the pandemic. Uh, we have now lived through um, several months of all of the pandemic and realize that for the rest of the world, life is starting to return to normal. But for folks who are seniors uh, or who are helping someone who is a senior, especially someone who is not well or someone who has memory issues, they are especially concerned about this issue, about making sure that during this time, uh, they, to the extent that, that, that the people that they love need care, they don't have to go to a nursing home if at all, if, and can avoid it if at all possible. So that's what really this is about. So you've, you've met my friends before, Frank and Mary, and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And Mary uh, and Frank's basic goal in life is to stay in their house until they die, be buried in the backyard. They own a house uh, that's worth about $300,000. Frank has an IRA worth about $200,000. They have joint savings of about two hundred thousand, so they have about seven hundred thousand dollars in assets. Frank uh, has so gets social security of two thousand a month, and Mary gets half of his, one thousand a month. They want to live in their house until they die. Um, so, for the the goal of this presentation is to help you think about how Frank and Mary could do let, deal with that if Mary were just not feeling well and needed to decide um, whether she needed to be in a skilled nursing facility because of physical or cognitive issues or whether she could stay at home. Her, definitely her goal is to stay at home um, at practically all costs while at the same time keeping the possibility of, of living in the nursing home in the future in mind. So in, in terms of how your planning is being figured out. So the first question for Mary, the first question is, is it safe? Is there a way that we can structure things so that Mary can stay at home? Um, and the person that you need to help you figure that out is a geriatric care manager. Fo most folks have never heard of geriatric care managers. They are people who are typically had a background in nursing or social work, but decided that their real mission in life is to help seniors figure out how to deal the issues that come up around being a senior, especially if you have medical issues. And so the, a geriatric care manager, and if you, if you contact us, I'd be happy to connect you with some of these geriatric care managers. Um, are, are they, they can typically help you with all of these questions, right? They're typically social workers or, or nurses. They're gonna help you figure out how safety, how you can make that house safe enough so that Mary can stay, uh, staffing, where you could find it, and what the possibilities are for getting it, and then resources, how you can be helped with paying for all of that. Other folks that you could talk to about these issues are often folks at the senior center. Uh, um, there may be, there probably is a social worker or other staff at the senior center who can help you think out many of these same things, or the folks at the ASAP, the Aging Services Access Point. Uh, I work in two areas, and one in central Massachusetts, that ASAP is Bay Path Elder Services. Uh, in the other, in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, the ASAP is Elder Services of Cape Cod and the Islands. They have staff that can help you also figure out all of these things. So first the question is, can the house be made safe? Excuse me, can the house be made safe? Do, what does it need to be made safe? Does it need a ramp? Does it need security? in terms of controlling for doors to make sure that people aren't wandering, wandering away, are there adaptations to appliances? Once again, I just wanna jump back to that elevator issue. Whenever I say elevator, people think about, you know, rich people's houses with fancy elevators and oh, that's gonna cost a ton of money. So actually one of my, uh, my uh, in-laws is now adapting their home, they live outside of DC, by putting in an elevator. Uh, right in the central, it's a standalone elevator in the middle of the house. Uh, and one of the things, and for around $50,000, and one of the things that they found when they talked to their real estate broker was that that was actually improving the value of the house because this is becoming more and more a feature that folks want to have in senior housing. So the question, of course, is, is not only what you need, but how do you pay for it? 
Let me talk about three sources of financing. The Home Modification Loan Program, HMLP, a home equity loan, remember Frank and Mary have a house, or a reverse mortgage. First, the, the Home Modification Loan Program. Just about no one has heard of this. Um, you can get information on this typically from your senior center or from the folks at the ASAP or look for it online. Uh, it is a program funded by the state. The income limits, if you're a family of two, if you're Frank of Mar Mary, is $204,000 a year. So that's not a problem. They will loan you up to $50,000 through this program specifically to make modifications to your home. Um, there is no interest. There are no monthly payments. And, the, and the, the debt is only due on the sale of the house or your death. This is a wonderful program which typically can pay for some or all of the improvements that you need. Second, this is what people typically think they need to do. They want to do a home equity loan. They're just going to go borrow money from the, from the bank and what they're going to get is a big credit card, a line of credit. The terms are going to be that, that, that if they pull money out of the line of credit from then on, they're going to start getting charged interest. Typically these go for a term of about 10 years. The interest rate varies, but it's typically now about 3%. The problem is there are monthly payments. Um, and because there are monthly payments, for Frank and Mary who are living on a fixed income, that's one of their goals. They may have some cash in the bank, but they don't want to be eating away at that cash by doing monthly payments. So a final possibility, which I strongly recommend to most seniors, if you are older you have a, and you have a home and you have equity in the home, get a reverse mortgage. A reverse mortgage works the same way as a home improvement loan, except that there are no monthly payments. You get a credit card, you get a, a, you know, a, a line of credit, you can pull money out of, that, out of that line of credit at any time. From the time you pull out the money, interest starts accruing on that money, but there are no required monthly payments. Instead, the interest every month, if you haven't paid it, you always can if you want, accrues, it gets added to the principal of the mortgage and therefore the following month the total amount of the principal goes up a little bit, but a very, very little bit. Once again, the, houses, the, the, the uh, mortgages due upon sale of the house or one year after the death of the, the, uh, the, the uh, second of the two people who signed the uh, reverse mortgage, or if the senior has been out of the house for, for continuously for 365 days. So the game that you play on this is that you simply make sure that during one day of the year, uh, if you have one of these reverse mortgages and you are no longer living at home, you go back home. Um, and finally, you can use these reverse mortgages while at the same time doing mass health planning. That is, if you're single, transferring your home to a third party uh, and waiting five years. I'm going to talk about that at the end. Um, now, the, so the first there's the house, second there's caregivers. So the question is, if you're Frank or Mary, or, or, and Mary, or their kids, how do, you make, how do you provide the care for Mary at home that will allow her to stay at home? First, what if you're Frank? Because you're typically the one who's been providing all of the care, and the question is, can you continue to do it? And my message to you if you're Frank is, there's help out there. Talk to a geriatric care manager who can help you connect to support groups and training. Talk to the folks at the senior center and at the ASAP, right, about other kinds of programs that they have just to help you deal with the day-to-day -day issues um, that you may be facing as a caregiver. If Mary has Alzheimer's disease, call the Alzheimer's Association. There's a wonderful Alzheimer's Association 24-hour a, a, a day hotline to help you deal with all those issues. The main thing is there are programs available. If you're Mary uh, and you're living close by and you may be wanting to help, there are some things that can also help you. But, but here are a couple of tips. If you're Mary and you're providing services to your parents or to one of your parents, um, and, and, and it's possible, you need to be looking ahead to the fact that at some point you may want to qualify for mass health if your parent is in a nursing home. Make sure that there is a written contract between you and the person you're providing services for. It's probably going to need to, to say that you're not getting paid more than a fairly small amount, like $13 an hour. That's a number that MassHealth often uses. And then you want to keep records of the amount of services that you're providing, what day. Just keep a diary so that you'll have that, those records later on. Um, finally, though, if you are Mary, 
and your mother qualifies for MassHealth, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program, there are two MassHealth related programs that may actually pay you some money. Uh, one, the so-called Caregiver Home Program, through which um, um, you can be paid, oftentimes another word for Caregiver Home Program is the ad adult foster care. You can be paid basically as the person who is taking care of your mother, the way that you'd be paid by the state if you were taking care of a foster child. Now the amount of payment varies depending on how much, how much care your parent would need. Um, but, the, but the point is that the money that you get, just like the money you get if you were taking care of a foster child, is tax-free. Finally, there's the so-called PCA program, the Personal Care Attendant Program, uh, which you can qualify for even as a child of the, the person to whom you're giving care, through which MassHealth may be paying you. Um, and I'm just going to mention this because we're kind of always thinking out what happens if Mary eventually needs nursing home care? In that case, if you have lived at home with your mother or father for at least two years and provided care during that two years, like the care we're talking about now, that keeps them from needing nursing home care, then if they end up going to a nursing home and qualifying for Mass Health, they may be able to give you the house um, because you were the caretaker child. Um, finally, what happens if mom and dad want to move in with you if you're Mary or one of the other kids? I'll just mention a couple of things. First, if that happens, Frank and Mary have the ability to buy an interest in your home called a life estate, an interest that terminates at the end of their lives. As long as they have purchased it and stayed in the house for at least a year before Mary needed nursing home care, as far as Mass Health is concerned, that purchase will have been not a gift to you as the children, right, but a legitimate purchase of an interest in property. Uh, if your parent ends up needing nursing home care, their life estate may get leaned, but following their death, the lien will evaporate, you'll end up still with owning your home. Finally, there is the possibility of joint tenancy. We have had situations where parents have actually purchased a joint tenancy interest with their children um, and, and paid them as a result equal, uh, an amount equal to about 50% of the value of the home. So you want to talk, you, uh, in any of these cases, of course, you want to talk to, a, to a, a, uh, an attorney. Um, finally, there's hiring staff. Do you really just want to hire the lady down the street and pay her under the table? This is a kind of a fundamental question. And the answer to that may be that you're okay with that, right? Um, do you want to hire an agency? Maybe you do, there are itch issues with that. And finally, how do you get help paying for all of those things? One possibility is the frail elder waiver. If you're paying someone informally, under the table, just understand the risks that you are taking. Um, first of all, um, that person for internal revenue ser service purposes is an employee. And you as an employer are supposed to be withholding taxes from some of the money that you're paying that person. Uh, and if you don't, and if that person later on has a souring of relationships with you, right, uh, and, and, and talks to the IRS about any of this stuff, the IRS may be coming and chasing you for some of those withholdings. Second, uh, if that person um, leaves your employment um, and, and tries to, to and, she, and, and says, and goes to the unemployment office and says, I was just being employed by this, other, this person, um, you're going to have a problem because the government is going to be chasing you for those unemployment payments. Thirdly, if that person slips and falls in your house and files a workman's comp claim, you have a real problem. And the way to deal with those issues would be to formalize this relationship. Not necessarily to not have that person, but to enter into a contract with them, to, withhold, to do the withholdings, to make the payments to, the unemployment, to, to unemployment insurance, to make the payments to workman's comp. There are services now that you can hire that will do all of those things for you. Uh, if you're trying to hire an agency, then there are a number of them out them, uh, of them out there. Uh, first and foremost, talk to your geriatric care manager or the folks at the Council on Aging or the ASAP. They may have some recommendations to, for you about who they might recommend and who might really work in your household. There are a lot of agencies out there they're not rated, they're not certified, there's no evaluation that you can easily get from a government entity as to whether or not they're legitimate. You want somebody 
who knows who's doing this kind of work in your area and who can make recommendations. Regarding how to pay for all of this, just a couple of observations. Under the federal tax law, and the Massachusetts tax law follows the federal tax law, if a doctor or nurse or social worker, like for example the geriatric care manager, certifies that the care that is being provided to a person at home is needed because that person has either or either need, has needed two assistance with two of the activities of daily living every or regularly, not necessarily every day, but regularly. Activities of daily living are eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, and transferring. Or that person needs constant supervision or regular supervision because of cognitive issues. If you get that certification, then all the payments that are being made um, to your informal person or to the agency or to whoever you're paying are tax deductible. That's extremely important in the Frank and Mary case. You may recall Frank and Mary don't have a great income. They're just living off their income. Say their income is total $3,000 a month, $36,000 a year. They can't afford out of that amount to be paying for a lot of home care. But they do have savings, right? And, and, and as a matter of fact, Frank has $200,000 in tax deferred funds. They've never wanted to touch those tax deferred funds because if they do, they have to pay the tax on it. Except, suppose in this situation, you're trying to provide for home care for Mary. And it turns out that that home care is going to cost you an extra $20,000 a year or $30,000 a year for a few years, especially, or, or for a year while you're trying to wait out this pandemic, right? So what Frank should do in that case is pull the money out of his tax deferred account um, knowing that the money that he pulls out, he's going to pay income tax on it, he's going to have to declare his income, but all of the payments that he's making to those care workers are all going to be legitimate medical expenses, as long as he has the certification from a doctor or a nurse or a social worker that, the, that, the, that those payments are necessary because of the care that Mary needs. That's first. Second, there's that reverse mortgage again, right? The, the, the reverse mortgage, it, in this situation, you certainly don't want to go for a, for a, uh, for a home equity loan because it, for Frank to be making the, the home equity monthly payments as well as paying for the home care would just be too much of a burden. This is a natural situation for the use of a reverse mortgage. Uh, and if you've got a home equity loan, which many people do, one of the things that the reverse mortgage will do is pay that off and ideally allow you to tap into some additional resource with, resources with which to, uh, to um, pay for the home care. Finally, there is a, a mass health program called the Frail Elder Waiver, um, which, which, which Frank and Mary should be able to qualify for. Remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets. They have a home, Frank has the IRA, there are joint savings of 200,000. Now, the mass health pre and, and, and Frank's ma maximum, Frank's income from Social Security is 2,000 a month and Mary's is 1,000 a month. Now remember, uh, in terms of qualifying for mass health, there are, there are asset limits. The way that mass health works is that before you can qualify, you need to show that you, that you meet certain asset criteria. In Mary's case, she has to have assets of less than $2,000. To qualify for the Frail Elder Waiver, there is no limit to Mary's income. However, if she qualifies, there, will be, there, may be a, there would be a deductible if her income were higher than about $2,300 a month. In this case, Mary's income, of course, is only $1,000 a month, so there won't be a deductible. Regarding Frank's income, that's unlimited. So the fact that Frank is getting all of, the, all of the Social Security, even though that combined with Mary's income equals more than that $2,300, is not relevant only Mary's income is counted. Frank, can, while Mary can't have more than $2,000 in countable assets, Frank can own the house, no matter what the equity value in it. Uh, Frank can have up to $128,640 in other cash or cash equivalent assets, but most importantly, Frank can have unlimited income. Unlimited income. So, what, what Frank and Mary would do in this case, if they felt that the Frail Elder Waiver was really going to be worthwhile for them, is, is all assets would get transferred to Frank from Mary. We'd take Mary off of, all, off of the bank account. We'd do a deed from Mary and Frank to just Frank regarding the house, which, by the way, just in parentheses, 
This is the reason why for seniors of all ages, I tell them the, the most important thing you can do as far as your estate planning documents is to have a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney. In this case, ideally, a power of attorney that Mary had already signed saying that Frank could sign things for her so that when this deed is being done from Frank and Mary together to Frank alone, Frank can sign his own name and can also sign Mary's name because he has the power of attorney for Mary. So we would transfer all assets to Frank. There is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. I'm gonna say that again. Everybody, everybody watching knows about the look back period and oh my God, we can't transfer assets out. There's a five year waiting period to qualify for mass health. That's not true regarding transfers between spouses. So everything I'm talking about here can be done at the last minute. So, so we shift all assets to Frank. Frank would keep up to $128,420. And then Frank would use the rest of the money to buy an annuity. The reason why he's buying this annuity is as a way to convert his asset, which is throwing him over the magic number here of $128,640 into an income stream. Because remember, Frank can have infinite income. So Frank could go buy an annuity, and as long as that annuity has these characteristics, it, ha it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. And by the way, it can't be, ca it can't be cashed in ahead of time. This, the, the whole point behind the purchase of this annuity is you're turning an asset into an income stream which wouldn't be the case if you had the ability, if Frank had the ability at any time to go get the asset. So the, the, the payments have to be due over this term, and as long as that happens, the day after Frank buys that annuity, Mary can qualify for mass health. By the way, a question always comes up regarding these, where, where, where people say, well, what, then what happens to the rest of the payments? What if Frank dies? Well, if Frank dies, Frank can specify in that annuity that Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. get the money or that a trust for the benefit of Mary gets the money. This money would not be subject to any mass health lien regarding any of the care that had been provided for Mary. So, so Frank can ask up and Mary can ask up restructure at the last minute before Mary qualifies for mass health. Once she is on the frail elder waiver, mass health will pay for up to 40 to 50 hours of home care per week. This is obviously a huge amount. It may not be an amount sufficient to take care of Mary if Mary needs 24 hour care, but if Frank is at home, or Frank is at home and Mary, and Mary Jr. is around, so that you don't really need a caregiver at night, you need a caregiver to help with meals and to help with dressing and to help with bathing and to help with other things, but you don't need a caregiver constantly, the, 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 the Frail Elder Waiver Program can be an ideal program specifically to keep people out of a nursing home. So um, there is a way, there is a way to, there may very well be a way to structure this. And, and then, and remember now in this situation, Frank and Mary have the house, they have, they have the, 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 uh, the, um, um, the tax deferred funds and they have a joint account. So that to the extent that once they've qualified Mary for the frail elder waiver, it turns out that Mary needs more than 40 to 50 hours of home care a week. They can now use their other resources, the cash, the tax deferred funds, the funds from the reverse mortgage to pay for the extra hours. But at least they're not paying for the first 40 or 50 hours a week. There are 8,760 hours in a year. 50 hours a week times 50 weeks is 2,500 hours. So this program can basically drop the total num amount of payment that you have to make to a much smaller number by taking care of almost a third of the hours in Mary's year. Uh, and remember, once, you've once Mary has qualified for the Frail Elder Waiver, she's, um, um, Mary Jr. would also be eligible for the PCA or Caregiver Home Program. Finally, as I said at the beginning, when you're trying to figure all of this out, you always want to keep in mind the fact that Mary at some point may need nursing home care. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the diseases, Alzheimer's and, 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 and MS, and, and Lou, uh, Lou, there are a number of diseases that have uh, dementia as a symptom, uh, or diseases that have this kind of ongoing need for physical help as a symptom. These diseases don't get paid for by Medicare. 
don't get paid for by Medicare. So, and they are mostly diseases where the symptoms just keep getting worse. People don't get better from Alzheimer's and they don't get better from MS. So you need to be planning always knowing that at the end of the day, Mary may need nursing home care. So given that fact, you wanna make sure if you're Frank and Mary, um, that you try to protect your, the assets as much as possible. Now, as I mentioned to you, to qualify for Mass Health, Mary can qualify almost right away while Frank is alive because all assets can simply be shifted to Frank. But what if Frank dies? What if Frank is taking care of Mary at home and Mary's health really deteriorates and, she now, and, 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 but, and Frank dies? Frank has a heart attack. At that point, if Mary becomes the owner of all the assets, Mary's got a problem because she has more than $2,000 in assets. Frank can take care of that though by having a will that says when he dies, any assets that are in his name will at that point go into trust for the benefit of his wife. He can name one of his kids as the trustee. If he structures things that way and then dies, all the assets are going to end up safe. Um, finally, what if in this situation Frank has already died and it's Mary Jr. and the family that are trying to figure all of this out, right? Well, in that case, um, one of the things you want to just be aware of is for is or two things you want to be aware of. First, regarding that caretaker child exception, if Frank, Mary Jr. then moves in with, with Mary, takes care of her for up to a year, even though she's getting money from these other programs and stuff, um, she will still qualify as the caretaker child. And when Mary goes to the nursing home, she'll be able to deed the house to her daughter. Um, finally, um, be aware of the fact that Mary could make gifts to her children during all of this time if she's not on Mass Health, but if she ends up going to a nursing home, the, the gifts that she does make are going to be subject to that look back period. So uh, this was a lot of information. Uh, if you have any questions on any of this, uh, you can call me at any time at my office. The number is 508-860-1470 or email me. You can email or you can connect us, you can connect with us um, at, our, uh, at our website. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this program. This is part of a monthly series. We'll be doing a, a number of these during um, uh, calendar year 2020. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.